Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, I'm going to be covering leukemia and lymphoma. So guys, if you're currently in school, you're covering hematology or oncology, this is the perfect video for you. If you haven't done so already, please don't forget to like and subscribe below. Excuse me, I think I have cold or cold's coming. Um, also guys, um, don't forget about all of my resources I have available for you on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. If you want to cover more NCLEX, HESI, ATI nursing topics, and you can't get enough of it, you watched all of my videos here on YouTube, don't forget I cover different questions on my other platforms such as TikTok, Instagram, Facebook. Okay. So you guys can check me out on my other platforms. Don't forget to check out my podcast, Nexus Nursing. Okay, guys, without any further ado, let's get started. First question. The nurse is caring for clients on an oncology unit. Which neutropenia precautions should be implemented? One, hold out venipuncture sites for at least five minutes. Two, limit fresh fruits and flowers. Three, place all clients in reverse isolation. Or four, have the clients use soft bristle toothbrush. And guys, the correct answer is to limit fresh fruits and flowers. Why? Because fresh fruits and flowers carry what? Bacteria, microbes, pathogens, and little insects, right? Um, this patient's already immunocompromised, so we don't want anything that can make them even sicker. So that is the correct answer. Now let's look at our other choices. One, hold all venipuncture sites for at least five minutes. That would be for a client that has thrombocytopenia, right? They don't have enough platelets, they're at risk for bleeding out. But our patient with leuco, um, leukemia, excuse me, what, what is down with them? They're WBCs, they're leukocytes, the WBCs, they're fighter cells, okay? Choice three, uh, place all clients in reverse uh, isolation. If you guys have been following me for any amount of time, you know this. Stay away from the all-inclusives. Don't choose that unless you know that you know that you know that you know that's an answer. So those words such as always, only, never, right? Don't choose it unless you know that's the answer. And this is wrong. Place all clients in reverse isolation. No, only those severe clients, the patients with severe neutropenia, you'd put in reverse isolation. Four, have the clients use a soft bristle toothbrush. Again, guys, soft bristle toothbrush, um, that would be patient who's on bleeding precautions. What bleeding precautions, what type of patient would that be? Thrombocytopenia, the patient that cannot clot, that's at risk for bleeding. So the correct answer, guys, is number two. Next question. The nurse is assessing a client diagnosed with acute myeloid leukemia. Which assessment data supports this diagnosis? One, fever and infections. Two, nausea and vomiting. Three, excessive energy and high platelet counts. Or four, cervical lymph node enlargement and positive, fast, positive acid fast bacillus. And guys, the correct answer is one, fever and infections. By the way, fever and infections, those are the hallmark. Hallmark classic signs and symptoms of um, acute myeloid uh, leukemia. Guys, when you're studying and you're reading in your textbook and you see words such as classic, hallmark, uh, cornerstone, um, characteristic, highlight it, underline it, put a star next to it. That means it's very important to know. That means every time you think about this, you need to think about this disease process. And let me tell you, like I said, guys, Fever and infection, that is a characteristic, that is a hallmark, that is a cornerstone, that is a classic sign and symptom of this disorder. Now let's look at our other answer choices, guys. Two, nausea and vomiting. Well, um, chemo and radiation will cause nausea and vomiting. So nausea and vomiting is a classic sign and symptom from the treatment, which would be chemo or radiation. Three, excessive energy and high platelet count. Actually, the patient with um, leukemia will have the opposite. They're gonna have low energy. They're gonna be fatigued. They're gonna be tired all the time um, because of the treatment. Um, high platelet counts, no. If anything, they're gonna have a low platelet counts, especially when they're getting treatment for the leukemia. Four, cervical uh, lymph node enlargement and uh, positive acid fast bacillus. Okay, so let's break that down. The first part, the cervical lymph node enlargement, we see that in Hodgkin's, 
okay? And the second part, the positive acid fast bacillus. What did I tell you every time you see acid fast bacillus? What is the first acid fast bacillus? What is the first thing that needs to be going to your mind? Tuberculosis, okay? So that's what they're talking about when you see the acid fast, um, acid fast bacillus. So the correct answer is fever and infections. Next question. The client diagnosed with leukemia has CNS involvement. Which instruction should the nurse teach? One, sleep with the head elevated to prevent the release, to prevent increased intracranial pressure. Two, take an analgesic medication for pain only when pain becomes severe. Three, explain radiation therapy to the, excuse me, explain radiation therapy to the head may result in permanent hair loss. Or four, discuss end of life decisions prior to cognit cognitive deterioration. Guys, forgive me, it's four o'clock in the morning. Um, I'm about to start my day. I haven't even gone downstairs to make my coffee yet, but I wanted to make this video for you before I went downstairs and started my day. So I'm kind of loopy still. The correct answer, guys, is three. Explain radiation therapy to the head may result in permanent hair loss. Now go back to the question, guys. Look what it says. The patient who has leukemia, they now have what? CNS involvement, all right? So this patient may be experiencing symptoms of uh, um, um, associated, you know, with the CNS, with the brain. So we expect that that patient's probably going to be getting radiation to that area. So we have to let them know radiation to where the where's the brain located in the head. So we have to explain to that patient that there may be some hair loss because remember that radiation is trying to kill those cells. Okay. Now let's look at our wrong answer choices. One, sleep with the head of the bed elevated to prevent. Mm -mm. It doesn't prevent increased intracranial pressure. What will elevating the head of the bed do? It can relieve increased intracranial pressure, but it won't prevent it from happening. So that's wrong. Guys, isn't that funny how one word will completely change an answer choice? You have to be very careful, okay? Choice two. Um, take an analgesic medication for pain only. What did I just tell you about these all-inclusive words? Don't choose that answer unless you know that you know that you know that's an answer choice. And that's wrong, guys. You're not going to tell them take an analgesic only when the pain becomes severe. Let me tell you something. Cancer pain is like one of the worst pains in the world, okay? So this patient is going to be on scheduled analgesics. And then what happens is they're going to get medications for breakthrough pain, PRN. But they're going to be on scheduled analgesics. So that's wrong. Choice number four, discuss end of life um, decisions before cognitive deterioration. Actually decreasing cognition guys is rare when we see that um, there's CNS involvement. Uh, decreasing cognition is rare, so we're not gonna teach them that. We're not gonna expect that. The correct answer guys is number three. Next question. The client diagnosed with leukemia is scheduled for bone marrow transplant. Which intervention should be implemented to prepare the client for this procedure? Select all that apply. Guys, how do we treat select all that apply? As true or false? Let's go. One, administer high dose chemo. Yes, absolutely. I want you to think about it. So this patient who has leukemia is about to get um, a transplant, bone marrow transplant, right? Well, they're gonna get high dose uh, um, radiation because all of those cancer cells need to be dead. They need to be destroyed before that transplant can take, take place. So yes, they're going to get excessively high levels. Two, teach the client about autologous transfusion. False. Auto to self. Okay, so autologous transfusion is transfusions where the patient's giving themselves whatever it is that they're transfusing. So they're re-giving themselves their own blood. They're re-giving themselves their own bone marrow. Absolutely not. This patient's bone marrow has what? Cancer. It's malignant. So why would they re-give it to themselves? Absolutely not. That's false. Choice three, have the family members HLA types. Absolutely. Absolutely. Preferably what? Twins, right? But if not twins, siblings, because the closer that that DNA is to the patient, the less chance we have of the patient's body actually rejecting those cells. Um, choice four, monitor the complete blood count. True. Absolutely. We want to see, um, number one, 
if it worked, we want to see if those WBCs are going up. But we're also checking those WBCs to make, make sure that that patient doesn't have an infection. That patient hasn't gotten sick. That patient has gotten worse, right? Choice um, five. Well, before I go to choice five, let me keep talking about choice four. Another reason, other reasons we're checking um, the complete blood count. When a patient's having a bone marrow transplant, remember the bone marrow, that's what makes all of your, your blood cells, your red blood cells, which carry the hemoglobin, which carries oxygen, right? That's what, if you don't have enough, you can be anemic. Your platelet cells, which keeps you from bleeding out, right? So we're going to be looking at these WBCs to make sure the patient doesn't have thrombocytopenia, make sure the patient's not anemic, uh, uh, make sure that uh, the leukemia hasn't gotten worse. So we're not just looking at the WBCs, we're looking at those other blood cells as well. Choice five, provide central line care per protocol. Absolutely. This patient who's getting the transplant, who has leukemia, they're going to have a central lines. They're going to have several lines. And guys, you know, especially central lines, any patient that has a central line, that places them at high risk for what? Infection. So absolutely, um, you're going to be doing a central line care per facility hospital protocol. Okay, next question, guys. The client diagnosed with CLL, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, after routine laboratory tests during a yearly physical, which is a scientific rationale for random nature of discovering the illness. One, CCL is not serious and the clients die from other causes first. Two, there are no symptoms with this form of leukemia. Three, this is a bloodline illness and it's self-limiting. Or four, in early stages of CLL, the client may be asymptomatic. And guys, the correct answer is four. In the early stages of CLL, the client may be symptomatic. It's in the early stages, so we won't see any of those signs and symptoms. That's why it could be caught just on a random, you know, physical, right? So let's look at our wrong answer choices. One, CLL is not serious. Stop. Let me tell you something. As a student, do not ever choose the answer choice that where something's wrong, you're saying, oh, it's not a big deal. It's not that serious. If something's wrong, it's always serious, okay? So let's get rid of that. Choice two, there are no, what did I tell you about all inclusives? No, none, never, always, only, stay away from them unless you know that you know that you know that's the answer. There are no symptoms. Absolutely not. Get rid of that. Three, there. Um, this is a childhood illness and it's self-limiting. It's absolutely not self-limiting. Four is the correct answer, guys. The client diagnosed with leukemia is being admitted for an induction course of chemotherapy. Which laboratory values indicates the diagnosis of leukemia? A, shift to the left, WBC differential. B, excuse me, two, a large number of WCs that decrease after the administration of antibiotics. Three, an abnormally low hemoglobin hematocrit level. Four, red blood cells that are larger than normal. I need some coffee. This is not working. All right, guys, the correct answer is one, shift to the left in white blood cell count differential. So guys, whenever you see a shift to the left, what that's telling you is that a whole bunch of immature, immature WBCs that can't do anything. They can't do anything. They're immature. A whole bunch of immature WBCs are being um, um, placed in the, in the patient circulation. So a patient has all of these WBCs that can't do anything, that cannot help them with immunity. That's what it means when you see a shift to the left. And so you should suspect leukemia when you see that. Absolutely, guys. Choice two, three, and four, they are wrong. Number, um, next question, which medication is contraindicated for a client diagnosed with leukemia? One, Bactrim, a sulfur antibiotic. Two, morphine or narcotic analgesic. Three, epigen, a biologic response modifier. Or four, Gleevec, a genetic blocking agent. And guys, the correct answer is three, epigen, a biologic response modifier. So what epigen does is it, um, it promotes or it pushes the, the patient's own barrel, own barrel. It pushes the patient's own bone marrow to produce more blood cells. Why would that be a problem with the patient that has leukemia? Well, the patient who has leukemia 
is producing what kind of cells? Malignant cells. These are cancerous cells. Do we want them making even more? No. Remember epigen, guys? That's the same thing with the patients who are Jehovah's Witnesses that really need blood transfusions or they're anemic and they're refusing blood transfusions. That's one of the things they may, may get, the epigen, just so their body will produce more RBCs, right? Which carry the hemoglobin, which will give them more oxygen. This is what we're talking about. But the patient with leukemia, do we really want their bone marrow producing more of those types of cells? Absolutely not. So that's going to be contraindicated. Uh, antibiotic, analgesics, and Gleevec, by the way, guys, um, this prevents, that's a medication. It's a medication that actually blocks those um, leukemic cells from like reproducing and um, dividing right? So those three medications, absolutely, we would expect a leukemic patient to get, but not epigen. Next question. The nurse writes a nursing problem of altered nutrition for a client diagnosed with leukemia who's received a treatment regimen of chemotherapy and radiation. Which nursing intervention should be implemented? One, administer antidiarrheal medication prior to meals. Two, monitor the client's serum albumin levels. Three, assess the client for signs and symptoms of infection. Or four, provide skin care to, irradiate, to irradiated areas. Irradiated irradiated, irradiated areas. And guys, the correct answer is two. Monitor the client's serum albumin level. Why? Think about it. Albumin, guys, which is a part of the blood, but what type of part of the blood is it? Protein. So the albumin levels will give us a give us an idea of how much protein that patient has. And that is part of what? Nutrition. The question said alter nutrition. So we're looking for an answer that has to do with the patient's nutrition or their nutrition level. One, administer an anti-diarrheal medication before meals. Actually, no, you want to administer what? An anti-emetic. We don't want the patient to vomit because if they're vomit, they're getting rid of their nutrition and we want the nutrition to stay in the body. So one is wrong. Two, assess for signs and symptoms of infection. What does that have to do with nutrition? Four, provide skin care. What does that have to do with nutrition? The question's asking us about altered nutrition. So number two, when it says monitor the serum albumin level, that is the correct answer because their albumin level tells us about what? Protein, the patient's protein. The nurse and the licensed uh, practical nurse are caring for clients on an oncology floor. By the way, let me stop. I hate when I see questions like that because when they say the nurse, they talk about the registered nurse, but the licensed practical nurse is also a nurse. So let's say the registered nurse and the licensed practical nurse are caring for clients on an oncology unit, which client should not be assigned to the licensed practical nurse? Now, here are our choices. One, the client newly diagnosed with chronic lymphocytic le leukemia. Two, the client who's four hours post-procedure bone marrow biopsy. Three, the client who received two units of packed red blood cells on the previous shift. Or four, the client who's receiving uh, multiple IV piggyback medications. And guys, the correct answer is one, the client newly diagnosed with CLL. Why? Any patient with a new diagnosis, they require extensive teaching, in-depth assessment, and the RN has to do that, okay? Now, let me tell you something. If a number one was not there, your next answer would have been number four, that patient that has a multiple IV piggybacks. Um, Depending on the state you're in, if you're an LPN, you cannot do piggyback. Florida is one of them, all right? But when you have two good answers, you have to always choose the best. And out of those two, it's going to be um, number one because um, that patient needs a, a whole lot of teaching, a whole lot of assessment. You cannot give that to an LPN and RN has to keep that patient. The nurse is completing a care plan for a client diagnosed with leukemia. Which independent problem should be addressed? One, infection, two, anemia, three, nutrition, or four, grieving? And guys, the correct answer, the only correct answer here is four, grieving. That, the nurse doesn't need anyone's help. They don't have to collaborate with anyone. They can address that on their own with the patient. How? Using, um, it's too early. My brain's not working. Use therapeutic, using therapeutic communication, right? But infection, anemia, nutrition, 
the nurse can't address that on her own. She has to collaborate with doctors, with registered dietitians, with nutritionists, uh, um, with oncologists. Those she can't do on her own, but the grieving she can address on her own, she does not have to collaborate with anyone in order to do that. The client asks the nurse, they say I have cancer. How can they tell if I have cop? How can they tell if I have Hodgkin's disease from a biopsy? The nurse's answer is based on which scientific rationale? One, biopsies are nuclear medicine scans that can detect cancer. Two, a biopsy is a lab test that detects cancer cells. Three, it determines which kind of cancer the client has. Four, the doctor takes a small piece of, the doctor takes a small piece out of the tumor and looks at the cells. And guys, the correct answer is number four. That's what that's what it is. The doctor actually cuts a small piece of that tumor and looks at those cells under a microscope, okay? And by the way, what they would be looking at, if it's Hodgkin's, they'd be looking for Reed Sternberg cells. That's your key. Guys, mark, um, mark it to memory. I promise you're gonna have to know that, okay? When it comes to Hodgkin's, what they're specifically look, looking for is the Reed Sternberg cells. Number four is the correct answer. Which client is at highest risk for developing a lymphoma? Um, one, the client diagnosed with chronic lung disease who's taking a steroid. Two, client diagnosed with breast cancer who has extensive lymph node, lymph node involvement. Three, the client who received a kidney transplant several years ago. Or four, the client who has had utero stent placements for a neurological bladder. And guys, the correct answer is three, the client who had a kidney transplant several years ago. Here's why. In nursing, whenever you're thinking of a, a transplant recipient, whether it's kidney, whatever it is, transplant recipient, something you need to be thinking about is uh, high dose steroids. That patient's gonna be on steroids so their body does not reject, you know, that, um, the donor, right? With that being said, that same steroid that that patient's taking so their their body doesn't reject that transplant, right? That same steroid that's helping them not reject, well, that same steroid is blocking their own immune system from protecting them against cancers, certain types of cancers. So that's why number three is the answer, that client who had a kidney transplant several years ago. Why? Because we know if they had a kidney transplant several years ago, they are on steroids. And those same steroids that are helping block the rejection are also blocking their own immune system from protecting them from certain types of cancers. Now let's look at the wrong answer choices, guys. We have um, one, the client diagnosed with uh, chronic lung disease who's taking a steroid. Well, they're high risk, right? Because they are taking steroid and this is a chronic condition, but they're not as high risk as that patient who is a, a transplant recipient. Choice two, the client diagnosed with breast cancer who has extensive lymph node involvement. Guys, the question is asking us who's at highest risk for developing a lymphoma. Choice number two is talking about a breast cancer patient that, you know, the cancer has extended to lymph involvement. Wherever that cancer originates, that is what the cancer is. So if a patient has breast cancer, yes, it extends to different places, but it's still what? Called breast cancer. It can metastasize, but the place of origination, that is what that cancer is named or called. Um, choice four, the client who had Yodel stent placement for a neurological bladder, that doesn't place them at high risk. Next question. The female client recently diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma asked the nurse about her prognosis. What is the nurse's best response? One, survival for Hodgkin's disease is relatively good with standard therapy. Two, survival depends on becoming involved in investigational therapy program. Three, survival is poor with more than 50% of clients dying within six months, five, excuse me, four, survival is fine for primary Hodgkin's, but secondary cancers occur within a year. And the correct answer, and this is good news, guys, is number one, survival for Hodgkin's disease is relatively good with standard therapy. And standard therapy um, does include this cocktail of radiation, chemo, meds, 90% of patients actually respond very well 
to the standard therapy for this. Excuse me. And so, guys, number one is the correct answer. The nurse writes a problem of grieving for a client diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Which collaborative intervention should be included in the plan of care? One, encourage your client to talk about feelings. Two, arrange for the family to plan a m memorable outing. Three, refer the client to the American Cancer Society's dialogue group. Or four, have the chaplain visit the client. Okay, guys, and the correct answer is four, have the chaplain visit with the client. Choices one, two, and three, did you guys notice um, they all have something in common? Those are all independent actions. Those are all things that um, the, the uh, nurse can do on her own without any collaboration. But choice four is a collaborative effort. She's getting another professional involved, and this is the chaplain. Which test is considered diagnostic for Hodgkin's lymphoma? And I gave you the answer a couple questions ago. Sorry about that, guys. Um, here are your choices. A, uh, one, magnetic re uh, resonance imaging of the chest. That's an MRI. Two, a CT scan of the cervical area. Three, an ESR rate. Or four, the biopsy of cervical lymph nodes. And I know you got the correct answer. It's for the biopsy of the cervical lymph node. They cut a piece of that um, tissue and look at, look at it under the microscope. And what are they expecting to find? Reed Sternberg cells. Oh my goodness, guys. We are already down to our last question. Which information about reproduction should be taught to the 27-year-old female client diagnosed with Hodgkin's disease? One, the client's reproductive ability will be the same after treatment's completed. Two, the client should practice birth control for at least two years following the therapy. Three, clients become sterile from the therapy and should plan to adopt. Or four, the therapy will temporarily interfere with the client's menstrual cycle. And guys, the correct answer is two. The client should practice birth control for at least two years following therapy. Why? Because this is a patient who obviously had to have treatment for this cancer, who'd gone through radiation, who'd gone through chemo, where, you know, cells in their body have been changed. And this is a fetus that's growing in their body. So they need a solid two years of not having any of those anti-neoplastic medications, um, which would be poisonous to the fetus, they need to have a solid two years of that being out of the patient's body before they get pregnant, okay? Now let's look at our wrong answer choices. One, the client's reproductive ability will be the same. That's not true, we don't know that. Um, actually, many uh, women uh, go into early menopause. So that's number one's actually 100% in control. Incorrect. It's not true. Uh, choice number three, all. Stop right there. What did I tell you about all inclusives? All. Always. Only. Never. None. Do not pick it unless you know that you know that you know that you know because it's usually the wrong answer. And this is the wrong answer. All clients become sterile? No, they don't. That's false. And choice number four, uh, the therapy will temporarily interfere with the client's men uh, menstrual cycle. It will temporarily no, it might temporarily, it may and it may not, okay? Them saying it will temporarily, that's kind of like an all-inclusive saying it's definitely and no, it's not. It might and it might not. So that's why number two is the correct answer. Guys, um, if you'd like to see more hematology um, subjects or oncology subjects, please let me know in the comment section. I'll make sure that I keep them coming for you. Let me know what you think about this video. If there's more things that you'd like to see, just go ahead and let me know. Guys, don't forget to check out my other uh, platforms. If you'd like to cover more nursing material, don't forget to check out my website for more resources, nexusnursinginstitute.com. Don't forget, I'm also on TikTok now, so be sure to check that out. And please, if you have not done so already, besides liking and subscribing to this video guys please do not forget 
if you appreciate the content that I'm delivering to you every single week, if I've been helpful to you, I'm asking you to do one thing, help my channel to grow. And you can do that by sharing my content, share my video on your social media. Maybe someone's following you that's in the nursing program and you didn't know they were in the nursing program. They're struggling. My video might be able to help them um, share it on your social media platforms and with classmates. By the way, guys, teachers, all over the country, nursing instructors. Thank you so much. I've gotten comments from students telling me that their nursing instructor actually played a video they didn't know about me all over the country. And actually in some other countries, I got some nursing instructors in Australia, the Philippines, um, Scotland, Canada. That is awesome. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you for sharing my material. And you guys will be seeing me next Sunday, one o'clock.